Welcome back to part 8 of Password Cracking 101 plus 1. In the last video we attacked a Microsoft Office Word file and we showed how you can use uh, tools that are generally shipped with Kali to extract the hashes from these protected files and then we went around cracking that with a dictionary and rule based attack. We're now going to move on to the, the bigger sort of section of the course, which is where we level up and move away from the kind of the traditional um, things that we've learned so far. So, you know, brute force, mask attacks, dictionaries and rules. These are all kind of common things that, uh, that many people are aware of, but what they're not aware of is some of the other attack techniques, especially when we introduce um, other tools that can help augment our ability to generate really, really interesting candidates. Before we get there, though, we're going to have a look at a little bit more about how Hashcat um, works and how it allocates work. So Jeremy Gosney, who goes by JM Gosney on Twitter, part of Team Hashcat, did a fantastic talk in DEF CON Safe Mode 2020 called Getting Advanced with Hashcat. And in that, he goes into a bit of detail about how we're actually able to achieve GPU acceleration. Because I said, as I said in an earlier video, Hashcat really leverages GPUs and allows us to crack at speeds which CPUs generally uh, can't reach. Now that's not to say CPUs are slow, uh, they're not. CPUs are very fast, they're generally faster than GPUs, but it's the ability for us to run many many tasks in parallel on a GPU that allows us to really leverage that uh, for password cracking. Now in this example here we've got the premise of a base loop and a modifier loop, or a mod loop as I'm going to call it. Now this base loop is what the CPU runs, executes, and the mod loop is what's executed on the GPU. Now, when you run Hashcat, uh, the more observant of you might have seen, it gives you a list of the devices that it's, it can see, see on your computer, on your host, and which devices are being used for an attack. Now, it's, it's not always going to use all of the devices. Hashcat is very uh, good and clever, and it will generally select the best you know, hardware for whatever it is you're doing. Um, but you can run with a CPU and the GPU together. And if you do, you know, you can see how some of the work might be sort of chunked out and proportioned between the CPU and the GPU in these instances. Most of the time you will generally get your word list loaded on the CPU and although we've got differing attack types here and you can see in the case of a brute force it's, it's sort of divided up as shown, rules which is where we spend a lot of our time or have been so far are always executed on the GPU and that's for very good reason as we'll touch on soon. However, overarching to this, if the mod loop is not there or it's very, very small, we're not going to leverage our all you know, powerful NVIDIA graphics cards to our fullest potential, to our best potential. Okay, so we're not going to get that GPU acceleration on really fast hashes. So when we password crack, whether we're running on a GPU or a CPU or both, whatever we're doing, there is going to be a RAM penalty. And that's the penalty for loading a word from disk for us. Now, the, the benefit to a GPU is that penalty is exactly the same as when it's loaded on the CPU, but the GPU can do thousands and thousands of rules worth of work for the exact same penalty. And we can see that very simply here. If we look at a, a basic hashcat command, attack an NTLM with a word list, we can see here we've got the base loop, um, we've got a, um, a dictionary here, and we're cracking at about 13 million guesses a second, 13,000 kilohashes a second. Okay, great. Let's add a GPU into that. Uh, let's get the mod loop and you'll see now that we've added in a, a rule and we're now cracking at 656 million guesses a second. So much, much more. Now, that, that's definitely going to add time. That's definitely going to make your attack longer in this instance, but we're not worried. We're not, we're not sort of discussing and arguing uh, about the length to, to attack a password here. This is just about leveraging our hardware to its fullest potential. So to really, you know, get as much bang for your buck out of your graphics cards as possible, you need to make sure you're giving them enough work because quite often you're not giving Hashcat enough work. Uh, so, sorry, I should say you're not giving your graphics cards enough work for Hashcat to really be really be getting on with. Okay, so we talked about fast and slow hashes in previous videos. We've looked at a bcrypt hash from Linux, which is really painfully slow. And we've looked at super fast hashes like Windows NTLM hashes. Okay. Now, slow hashes are generally the memory or compute bound, and we've got an example of a memory bound one coming up in a, in a later video. But slow hashes are really slow because the kernel's spending all of its time trying to calculate what the hash is. Okay. Now, because of the amount of time that takes, the GPU doesn't need many candidates to, to keep itself busy. But on the flip side of that coin, fast hashes are so fast, they're, they're too fast, we can't actually get candidates from the CPU to the GPU quick enough. So to try and solve this, what we do is we get the GPU to generate candidates directly, that way it's keeping itself occupied and it's keeping itself busy. 
Okay, and we can see a bit of that in action here when we look at um, fast hashes and slow hashes when you're running with just a GPU or whether you're running GCPU and GPU. So let's take NTLM first of all, super fast hash. Cracking on a GPU, you can see here we're getting 422 million hashes per second. Now, it doesn't matter that the hardware this is on because it's the same hardware. It's, I think it's my laptop, so it's not going to be quick, um, but it's, it's uh, you know, consistent. But if we do the same type of attack and say I want to use the CPU and the GPU, you can see here that we actually come out with a lower uh, hash rate overall. Whereas on the flip side of that, if we look at Bcrypt, which is painfully slow, try and do that on a GPU, and I got 46 hashes a second. If we introduce the CPU, we can up that somewhat as well. So the way Hashcat allocates this work, it's very clever how it does it but we need to be aware of what we're attacking and what our hardware limitations are sort of therein. So we can try and do our best to do a bit of testing and see if we can make sure we're getting the most uh, bang for our buck, as I said before, from our hardware. Okay, the next thing, benchmark. Um, benchmark does not always equal speed, okay? This is like the advertised mileage you get when you buy a, when you buy a car. You don't always get what it says, but it's a, it, you know, depending on how well you drive it, admittedly. But these benchmarks are the, you know, the kind of the ideal situations for Hashcat. Uh, and it's certainly good in terms of its consistency. So benchmarks across the board will give you a really good idea as to how your hardware is performing compared to other hardware. But in terms of like real life speed that you will consistently get when cracking, it's not always the case. So it's just something to be aware of. The dash dash speed only switch, though, gives a slightly more realistic figure. So in this example, you can see here, we're doing a benchmark on mode 1000 NTLM, and you can see my laptop says, oh, you're gonna get you know, 10 and a half billion guesses a second. Okay, fantastic. If I do the same thing, but take an eight character brute force, for example, and say speed only, you can see it drops a little bit. And this is a lot closer to what, what my system would actually get. Okay, so it's not, you know, it's not the biggest drop in the world, but it's enough to, it's enough to make a difference, especially when time is of the essence and you're looking to calculate attacks within finite time frames, which is what we're going to look at here. So let's take, and I'm using 9.56 giga hashes as an example, because it's, it's what I'm working with here, 9,500 million hashes, okay? So we're going to take this speed, and I want to conduct a brute force over the full ASCII key space here. So uh, 95 to the power 8, 95 printable characters raised to the power 8. Brilliant, math is good so far. If we take that key space, divide it by our hash rate, we'll get the number of seconds we need to exhaust that key space, okay? So that's approximately eight days. But what if we don't have eight days, okay? Or eight, you know, it, it, gets, it gets close enough. Um, what if we don't have eight days, though? What if we only have eight hours? Well, we can help increase our chances somewhat by uh, modifying the base loop, okay? So what we can do here is we can say, right, we've only got eight hours. Eight hours is 28,800 seconds. Let's take our hash rate, multiply it by the amount of time we have, and we need, now we've got the guesses we need to get through in eight hours. So we need to get through a huge number of guesses in eight hours, okay? If we take that number and raise it one to the eighth, in this case, we're brute forcing the eight character key space, we get this magical figure of 64. And what we can do in Hashcat is we can apply dash T 64. And what this will do is it will alter our Markov threshold and how many Markov characters we're going to test in our key space. So what we've done is we've reduced our base loop from 95 to the 8, our full ASCII key space, down to 64 to the 8. Now, does that mean that you're going to exhaust the full ASCII key space now in 8 hours rather than 8 days? Absolutely not. We're not saying this at all. But what you are going to do is you're going to get the most likely or the most probable guesses exhausted in a time frame that you've specified by moving that Markov, Markov threshold a bit. So instead of Hashcat looking through the entire character set, it's gonna take the, the first 64 characters out of 95 based on its Markov probability and only test those. So it is a best effort, but you know, if you're if you're really, really running out of time, it might be something you can do to help, you know, cover some more ground with potentially more likely opportunities for success. Okay, optional hashcat switches. Just a couple of things because we might look at, um, well, I'm probably gonna use workload later on. Uh, workload is how hard we want hashcat to work. Think of it as like how much we're gonna overclock hashcat by. By default, it runs in mode two. We don't need to specify workload on the command line. It runs in mode two by default. As you can see here, we've got default performance. Okay, 
if you want to assign work mode workload three or four we can get obviously some more power out of this uh, workload four isn't generally suggested unless you're using a, a headless operating system that's doing nothing else wouldn't generally recommend it if you're trying to work on the same system you're cracking on um, work mode three is kind of a, a safe area that I often use but if it's on our you know our dedicated password cracking rig it's generally work mode four um, as you can see insane power consumption and nightmare performance it's it's all good stuff so it basically it really just overdrives hashcat as much as possible identify touched on the hash auto identification that I mentioned in an earlier video so you can say look I've got a file inside this I've got a file inside a file called hash sorry I've got a hash inside my file and I want to identify it in this case it's not always great to do because you might get a number of different hash modes that match the structure of your hash so for example if you give a uh, hash a 32 character um, hex string in here in this file it's going to say well hang on it could be any one of these that all have that same hash construction okay this is why we really need to know our hash it's useful sometimes um, and it can sort of lead you down some some paths um, but generally um, generally more often than not we know the types of hash we're going to be cracking okay next overflow errors so a common thing I see is uh, the integer overflow detected in key space of your mask and I've had people sort of say well hang on why is this why is this not going wrong why, why is this why is this breaking sorry why is it going wrong now this isn't actually hashcat it's you you're trying to get it to do more than is kind of physically possible now in hashcat the key space value is stored by an unsigned 64-bit integer and that key space has a maximum has a finite limit of the numbers it can store now this is 2 to the 64 minus 1 as shown here okay so we're in the realms of 64-bit computing the best brute force in this case can be worked out as follows the floor of the log of 2 to 64 minus 1 over the log of our key space Assuming we're attacking a 95 character key space here, you can see we've got three, six, nine, we've got 10 question mark A's. So I've tried to do a brute force of a 10 character password and I've got this integer overflow. That's because the floor of this gives us, it's like 9.6 or 9.7 or something, but the floor needs to be an integer. So the highest integer, the highest character we can get is nine. And that's why 95 to the 10 is greater than 2 to the 64 over 1 okay now in this particular instance if I'm trying to crack a, a, a 10 character um, 95 uh, sorry a 10 character password using the 95 principal ASCII characters I need to rethink my strategy anyway because that's not that's not going to finish uh, it's not going to finish it'll take hundreds of years or however long it'll take but if you see this you need to rethink your strategy you need to rethink how many characters you are testing and you need to think about the character sets you are testing also because the maths speaks for itself okay we're going to move on to keyboard walking now which is so so underloved and it's something that you know we as society still do loads if we're not guessing if we're not using really predictable dictionary based words for our passwords we love to think that keyboard walks like qwerty or running our hand across the middle line of the keyboard makes it more secure unfortunately patterns are just as predictable as words and kw processor is a tool um, that can be used to help us attack keyboard walks which is great as you can see here, if you run the help of KWP, um, which comes with Hashcat Utils, and you can get it from here as well, K Processor, um, you'll see it does a number of different things. It feels like you're looking at a CLI-based compass because you can see like north and south and east and west. What this is doing is it's allowing you to configure how many directions you want your keyboard allowed directions you want your keyboard walk to go in, the maximum distance, whether you want to include things like modifiers, so shift. Alt GR and things you can do absolutely loads with it. It's fantastic. So, what? How can you go about using KW Processor for a keyboard walk attack? Well, KW Processor comes with some base character sets. Nearly always use full dot base. Uh, so that's just that's just a given. We don't ever want to use tiny. We then have a number of key maps. So you can apply this to this. This of course only a number of supported key maps. But apply this to your keyboard mapping. And it has a number of routes that, as you can see, will support different lengths of passwords in different directions. So in this case, you know, 
This supports between two and ten character passwords with a maximum of three direction changes. So you could roll, you know, you could go one, two, three, and then back on your keyboard, four, five, six, and then back on your keyboard, seven, eight, nine, ten, for example. So what you get out of it, of course, is going to be defined by what you assign in terms of your root, and also what's possible with um, key spaces and what can be held by Hashcat. So don't just assume you can run everything all the time because it might not be computationally possible to do it. But there's loads of really cool ways you can do things here, and as you can see, you what you can do is run a KWP processor, in this case I've just got it to, to stand it out, and you can see how it starts off at two characters and it's going to start doing uh, keyboard walks, so keys that are kind of next to each other in different directions and that can build up to as big as you want it to be. An example syntax for how you'd build that into an attack is shown here, um, and Hashcat thankfully for us is fully kind of like pipelineable, you can pipe things in and out of Hashcat and it works wonderfully. So you can use key, uh, KWP, assign your um, your character set, your base char set, your keyboard mapping, how many routes you want to look at. Dash O and Dash Zero are always recommended, because what these do are key walk all, which means it allows to enable in all directions, so we're not just going to say only move right or only move left. And the Dash Z is keyboard all for modifiers, so it'll, it'll use Shift and Alt GR as well, so you're not just going to miss out on, you know, symbols and other things elsewhere. Okay, um, and then what you can do is you can pipe that into Hashcat with your mode and your hash as is, and it will then take the candidates generated from KWP and feed them into this uh, Hashcat attack session. So one can literally feed the other, it's great. Okay, exercise eight, walk this way. So we have an NTLM hash in exercise eight. I won't cat this out on the screen because it's just a, a boring NTLM hash. But we've got a password that's a 10 character walk on a US keyboard that changes direction three times. Again, I fully appreciate that adversarially we wouldn't know these things before attacking a hash, but this is getting you used to using the tools so you can experiment and apply this in your own testing and things. So let me grab Kali back, and I am going to grab my attack command. So, quite a long one now. Um, there's a folder inside your Hashcat folder called KW Processor, and within there we have the KWP binary. So the positional requirements are, are needed for this. As alluded to on an earlier slide, we first want to be, need to give it the character set. We're going to use full base. We then want to give it the keyboard map, and we're going to use a US keyboard map because we've got a 10 character walk on a US keyboard. And finally, our password is going to change direction three times. So we've got two to 10, maximum of three directions. We've enabled all keyboard walk directions and we've enabled all keyboard walk modifiers. That's going to generate a huge list that we are then going to pipe into Hashcat, attacking an NTLM hash, as we stated, that's mode 1000, and there's our hash value. So if we run that, you can see that we're starting attack in standard in mode. Okay, so this is Hashcat's way of saying it's not taking our uh, candidates from a dictionary, it's taking our candidates from standard in. And you can now see it running. The only thing with this is you don't um, have off option to press the S for like repeated status updates with standard in mode. So you have to kind of wait for it to auto give you an update to the screen. But you can see here it started running and then it cracked. Luckily for us very quickly, 13 seconds in. And this is our password. And if you look at that and then kind of look at your keyboard, as I'm sure you'll all be doing now, you can see how we're starting at zero, going down to eight, then pressing the shift key and then moving backwards to get those brackets and the underscore. And you can see how it moves backwards and forwards to get that. And that is a keyboard walk. OK, 280,000 guesses a second. Again, take that with a pinch of salt, be it what you will. It's not especially quick. Um, but as I've, as I've probably harped on enough about now, you know, if you're doing this properly, you, you don't ever crack on a VM, uh, crack on, on dedicated hardware. But hopefully that was a bit of an insight, um, and it's certainly something you should have um, some, you know, some attacks ready that you can sort of repeat on demand so that when you've tested your dictionaries and tested your uh, word lists, you can start looking at things like keyboard walks and other things, more exciting things that we're going to look at as this training progresses. But with that, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in the next video.